Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, the text before us is taken from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 6. You heard Pastor Courtright read those words earlier. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Can you hear me okay? It's one of the things with guest preaching, you never know quite on the volumes how that's always going to work out. <clears throat> one of the things that I think is really interesting when you read through the scriptures is seeing the different reactions that men had when they were called by the Lord to serve him. Sometimes they were noble, sometimes a little less than noble, sometimes they were outright sinful in their reactions. Just think back to your Sunday school days with some of those famous stories, the calling of, of Abram. Uh, Abram's at an age where he should be thinking about retiring and settling down, right? And yet God comes to him and he says, Abram, I want you to grab your wife, grab all your stuff, Leave your family, leave your friends, leave your homeland, and take off to this distant land. Just trust me, and I'll, I'll show you the way. And Abram, of course, does it at the drop of a hat. Or Moses. Moses gets called at the burning bush. God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to go square off with Pharaoh. I want you to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful man in the world, and I want you to demand the release of my people from slavery. What did Moses do? He hemmed and he hawed. He had a, a bag full of excuses, right? Oh, Lord, I... What if they don't believe me? Lord, uh, who, who am I supposed to say has sent me? Lord, my tongue always gets tied up in knots. Lord, please, just send somebody else to do it. Or Jonah? God calls Jonah to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, and he says, if they don't repent, I'm going to destroy the city. And Jonah says, oh, you promise? You're going to destroy our enemies if they don't repent? In that case, God, I'm hopping in a boat, and I'm going in the opposite direction, as far away from Nineveh as possible. Different men, different reactions. Sometimes noble, sometimes a little less than noble, sometimes downright sinful. I love this lesson before us today. I love the prophet Isaiah's reaction. He doesn't say, I'm not going to do this. He doesn't say, I can't do this. He says, I shouldn't do this. Isaiah had a tough time wrapping his brain around this thought. How can I, the sinner that I am, go and be a representative for the almighty, all-holy God? How can I, a sinful creature, go and preach on behalf of the almighty, all-powerful creator of creation? Or as he put it, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I'm unworthy for such an awesome task. Isaiah tells us about that day he realized his depravity in the chapter 6 of his scroll. He describes it in this way. He says, on that day I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, those are angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Can you imagine seeing something like this? The glory of God's righteousness shining so bright you had to squint your eyes, you could barely catch a glimpse. Beaming all around you. The smell of the smoke from the altar filling your nostrils. The sweet sound of the seraphs serenading the Lord and swirling all around you. That song filling your ears. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be a, 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 the best day ever? Wouldn't that be a time where you, know, you, you pull your phone out and snap a selfie in the throne room of God and say, you all aren't going to believe what I saw and where I was. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great? But you don't hear a hint of happiness, not an ounce of joy, trickle off Isaiah's lips, do you? It's only terror and dread. There was one thought that was gnawing at his heart. I shouldn't be here. I can't be here. How can I, the sinner that I am, stand in the presence of the almighty, all perfect, all holy God, much less look upon him and live? How can I, a man whose soul is so stained with guilt, come into the presence of this righteousness. I shouldn't. I, I, I shouldn't be here. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. We've never seen something like this before. But honestly, we wouldn't need to. When we, when we just sit down and consider for a moment, like we did earlier during the confession of sins, when we compare our character to that of God's, don't we come to the same conclusion? Woe to me, I'm ruined. But it's more than just my lips. It's my eyes. It's my hands. It's my heart. All of me is ruined. Every ounce of me oozes with that sin. Every breath that I utter is contaminated by it. I can't go one hour without showing some symptom of a sinful heart. Woe to me. Ruin. Why should God let you, a ruined person, into his kingdom? When I was working at my mission church in North Carolina, usually uh, I'd bring that question up as I was canvassing on the streets. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? Most people say, yeah. Well, why? And he always had a variety of different answers. Uh, but basically they boil down to two. A person will either try to make themselves less sinful or God less holy. Yourself less sinful. I'm a pretty good guy. Ask around. I'm a fair employee. I, I work hard at my job. My employer can attest to that. I treat my wife with dignity and respect. I play with my kids. I even coach Little League. I volunteer at the hospital every other Saturday. I've never cheated on my taxes. I'm a good guy. Never been to jail. Right? 
Anybody can tell you I'm a good person. Either try to make yourself less sinful or God less holy. People would say, Pastor, you talk about God being full of grace and full of patience and full of peace and love and mercy. And yet you say that that same God will damn someone to hell for all eternity? That doesn't sound like a very loving, patient, peaceful, merciful God to me. God would send someone like me to hell? Really? Me? I'm not even the worst person on my cul-de-sac. And you're saying God would send someone like me to hell. You either try to make yourself less sinful or God less holy. And either response, really, though, it, it shows a, a complete misunderstanding of the true depravity of the sinful condition and the perfection and righteousness of God. So what does God do? What does he do with Isaiah? There he is, shaking in his sandals. He's terrified, he's petrified, he's scared out of his mind. What does God do? Does he say, you're right, Isaiah. You are pretty rotten. You are pretty ruined. Kicks him out of his presence and banish him to hell? No, he doesn't do that. Does, I, does God say, oh, Isaiah, quit being so hard on yourself. Come on, you should see what some of your neighbors have been up to. You're not nearly as ruined as you think you are. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't say, well, Isaiah, we'll just pretend we didn't see it. God's not like Grandpa. He doesn't wink at sin and say, oh, that's okay. He doesn't do that. No, what God does is he recognizes the same thing Isaiah sees, and God is the one who fixes the problem. God is the one who set things right. And he does it in such a cool way. He takes something that looks like all it's going to do is hurt. And all it's going to do is produce pain. And he uses it to heal. He takes something that looks like it's not going to do anybody any good, and he uses it to bring about a tremendous transformation. One of those seraphs, one of those angels, takes a break from singing praises to the Lord and he comes swirling down and he goes to the altar, that place of sacrifice, and he grabs a hunk of heat. And then he gets closer and closer closer. You're panicking and I'm not even an angel and you're panicking. <laughs> Imagine that. An angel gets closer and cl what's that going to do? That hot coal, what's that going to do? All that's going to do is blister and burn, right? All that's going to do is produce pain and hurt and suffering, right? And yet God takes something that looks like it's not going to do anybody any good and he uses it to bring about this awesome transformation. He takes something that looks like all it's going to do is produce tears and hurt and sorrow, and he uses it to bring about an amazing healing. Listen again to what God does. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Atone, atonement, you've been made at one with God. There's no beef between you and God anymore. There's, there's no sin in this relationship. You are at one, at peace with God. first glance, the scene is a little strange. A 33-year-old man hangs on an instrument of death. What good is that going to do? 
All that's going to do is produce hurt and pain, tears of sadness. And yet, God took something that looked like it wasn't going to do anybody any good. And he used it to bring about an amazing transformation. He took something that looked like all it was going to do was produce hurt, pain, and sadness, and sorrow. And he used it to bring about a tremendous healing. Because, brothers and sisters, when Jesus laid down his life on the altar of his cross, he suffered the punishment that should have been ours. And he seared our sins away from our soul. When Jesus laid down his life on the cross, he made the punishment for our sin. And just as the angel said to Isaiah, so your risen Savior says to you, peace is yours. See, your guilt is taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. Sisters and brothers, this is the gospel that has pierced our ears and warmed our hearts this is the good news we celebrate Sunday after Sunday, week after week. This is the good news that we praise God for every time a little one is brought to the font or every time we come to the Lord's table, as we'll do later this morning, and we literally feast on forgiveness where our lips taste and see that the Lord is good. We've been changed. We've been transformed. We've been made from sinners to saints. From enemies of God to his sons and daughters. And all that would be enough. We can say amen right now and just be done. But our gracious God continues to give more and more and more. He poses the question to Isaiah, the same question that he poses to you. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who's going to tell people the good news of salvation? Who's going to tell people about my love and about my forgiveness? I need some help. Who's going to do that for me? Our God says. My nephew is getting married uh, this coming Saturday. So we have family coming in from California, Tennessee, all over the country to come in for the wedding. Uh, being busy with the school year, I, I, my honey-do list starts to grow and grow and grow and then summertime's the time where I start to try and chip away at it and with all this family coming into town I, I got to start taking care of some of those things and so I, I've, I've been working on that this last week or, week or two. I did some weeding around the house, I, I put a new outlet, in, uh, electric outlet in, um, put together a table that my, my wife just bought for our, our new, uh, for, for our deck and I asked my kids during those projects to give me a hand. They're nine, eight, and six. Now when I asked a six-year-old to help me with a project, she didn't bellyache like my teenage nephew might. She jumped at the opportunity. Dad, you need my help? Sure, I'll help. So we did some weeding. I showed the girls, this is how you pull the weeds out. I, I showed my son, hey, here's how you turn the electric box off. Here's how a screwdriver works. Here's what an Allen wrench does. We, we did those projects. We put those things together, and they were so ecstatic. Do you remember that? Do you remember that feeling when you were six, seven, eight years old, and, and Dad asked you to come give him a hand in the garage? I can help because I'm big and strong. I'm six. I have huge muscles. My brother, he's only five. He's just a little baby. But I'm six. I can do this. Mom asked you to help her in the kitchen. Oh, really, Mom? You need my help? Can I stir? Do you need that? Sure, I can do that, Mom. Absolutely. Do you remember that feeling? Our God, who fills heaven and earth, who has legions of angels at the command at the tip of his tongue, our God who spoke, snapped his fingers, and made this whole world, 
says to his children, who's going to help me out? Who's going to work with me in this service? Though God could use any other means to share his gospel, to share the news of his love, in his mercy and by his, his gracious invitation, he invites us to do it. Our God is calling, my friends. He's calling to you. How will you go for him? Maybe for you, going for God means hopping in with Pastor Courtright and Pastor Moldenhauer on the next canvas outing and pounding the pavement with your feet and knocking on doors and handing out flyers, inviting people to what's going on at our Redeemer on Sundays. Maybe, maybe going for God for you means inviting that neighbor over for a cup of coffee, telling them what you talked about in Bible study on Sunday morning. Maybe going for God for you means carving a little bit more time out of your week to sit down and pray for your pastors, pray for our missionaries at home and abroad, pray for the graduates that just got out of our seminary and college and will be heading to their new assignments. Maybe it means carving out a few extra dollars out of your budget to support the ministries. Maybe going for God for you means prayerfully considering lending your son to a school like Prep so he can consider the ministry someday. Maybe going for God for you means stepping into a pulpit yourself someday and being a pastor. Maybe going for God for you means helping out with the Sunday school. Maybe going for God for you means stepping in Monday through Friday and teaching third grade to God's little lambs. Maybe it's a combination of all those things. I don't know. But our God is calling, dear friends. He's calling and he's graciously inviting us. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So here we are. May God send us and bless us. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which transcends all understanding